Welcome to or welcome back to Wrong Sports. And if you haven't checked out the first episode in this series on how TV changed college football, please do because things will make more sense. And I will put a link below or in the upper right hand corner right now. But real quick, now that the NCAA are the kings and rulers of college athletics and a governing body over all things college athletics, things in college sports would be pretty even keeled during the 1950s and 1960s and most of the early 1950s. 1970s. But then in 1977, a group of colleges would come together to try and fight off the NCAA's draconian rules, which would lead to another big court case that would change college sports even more in the 1980s. But before we get to that court case, we have to go over the group that helped that court case. That would be the College Football Association. Who was in this group? what they wanted to do, and what happened to them, and college athletics as a result of this association is what I'll be going over in this next episode. But before we get to that, make sure as always you subscribe to the channel below, and as always, ring the bell so you can get updates on when I'm going to be dropping episode 3 of this series. Of course, like this video, share this video, and share this channel with other college football fans so we can keep my subscriber numbers up, and you can help out the channel on my Patreon, or check out my social media, or my podcast. All the links are in the description below. But where the last episode left off, the NCAA would look really strong after their defense of the University of Pennsylvania's fight for their own TV rights. Due to the NCAA ultimately winning and Penn backing off, the next two decades would see the NCAA have full control over which teams went on TV and how many times they could appear on TV. That rule was that no team could be on TV more than one time in any year, but that would get amended to no more than four times or maybe even three times over the next two years. And one of those games that helped to do that was the 1965 game between Notre Dame and Michigan State, which only got a nationally televised window after tons of complaints from fans and TV stations that wanted to see this game, and for some reason the NCAA didn't want anyone to. All of these regulations not only made larger schools mad, but on top of that, the NCAA forced their TV partners to carry other sports and lower level college football games. This would be seen towards the mid-1970s, where the NCAA forced ABC, their TV partner, to air college football games from smaller schools. And I mean schools that would be in D2 and D3 now. In addition, the NCAA would push for other championship sporting events to air, like volleyball, soccer, and baseball. I get why they wanted to do this, as they wanted to try to grow their other sports and gain more popularity nationwide, but instead, all it did was have lower viewership, which annoyed ABC, as they were forced to carry these games if they wanted to get any of the big-time college football games. It also pissed off some college football teams as well, since the coveted TV windows were now being used by smaller teams in non-football events. All of that would come to a head in 1977, when the NCAA was going to have a vote for their new TV agreement. And these votes would usually happen during the NCAA meetings, and the last few times they have voted on TV rights, it had gone the same way, with schools voting in majority for the ABC package or whatever the NCAA came out with. The ABC TV package had grown through the years and were paying teams six figures or more per TV appearance. And it didn't matter how much of the country saw you, that would be significant. An example of this, which you will hear again in another episode, was in 1981, when the Oklahoma and University of Southern California game would happen. Both of these teams were ranked in the top five and appeared on 200 stations in a regional broadcast, even though like 90% of the country could see it. On the same weekend, though, ABC televised a game between the Citadel and Appalachian State, which was only on four stations, and maybe a couple of hundred thousand people saw that game. But what larger schools were mad about was that all four teams would receive the same amount of money for appearing, even though a few hundred thousand people would see the Appalachian State versus Citadel game versus pretty much everyone else that saw the USC-Oklahoma game. Due to all teams receiving the same amount of money, the TV deals would easily pass in the NCAA meetings, since there were 300 schools voting, and two-thirds of them were smaller schools looking for any payday from their athletics. With the next NCAA meetings coming up, and to combat this, 
the College Football Association was formed by schools of the Atlantic Coast Conference, the Big 8 Conference, the Southeast Conference, the Southwest Conference, plus independents like Notre Dame, Penn State, Pittsburgh, and West Virginia, and also some of these service academies. But if you heard, there might be some noteworthy omissions, like teams from the Big 10 and Pac-8, which didn't join in. The reason for them staying with the NCAA isn't really clear, but the two conferences were enjoying tons of money from the Rose Bowl game, which only invited Pac-8 slash Pac-10 teams and Big 10 teams. Along with that, the Big Ten and Pac-10 had sided with the Ivy League schools in previous years and on previous votes, since the Big Ten and Pac-10 always saw themselves as on the level of the Ivy League, both on the field and in the classroom. Also, the Ivy League still wielded a lot of power in the NCAA at this point, and the Pac-10 and Big Ten thought of siding with them was the best for their survival. But since those schools weren't in the CFA, they didn't know about the plan that the College Football Association had, which was to not vote against the new TV agreement, but instead to abstain from it. This was seen as more of making a statement, since the athletic directors and representatives from the schools would be at the conference, and instead of aligning with the other schools that would obviously vote for the NCAA's deal, they would be seen as making a protest against the other schools and the TV rights. Even though these 60 or so schools from the College Football Association would abstain from the new TV rights package, it would still pass, as again, there were over 200 smaller schools that all voted for it, as well as the Ivy League, Pac-10, and Big Ten. But now with over 60 schools abstaining from the TV package, it was certainly seen by the NCAA and other colleges that they were wanting a new direction for this TV deal. So pretty much from 1977 until 1981, the College Football Association would be in the shadows as they negotiated with other TV networks and also sent out feelers to other TV networks to see if they could get a TV package for their 60 schools and maybe even leave the NCAA as a whole and create their own organization. No, the College Football Association never did break away from the NCAA, but they instead did something else fairly bigger and shocking, and that would be announcing in the summer of 1981, just weeks before the 1981 season, that the group had signed a deal with NBC for four years and $180 million to broadcast college football games in prime time, which was huge because ABC was kind of doing it, but they weren't doing it on a weekly basis. This NBC deal would actually give the 60 or so teams in the College Football Association prime time games throughout the season. It also allowed teams upwards of four games on television per season, which was at least double the amount that the ABC slash NCAA deal allowed teams. And finally, this deal was intriguing and big because it offered split revenue for all 61 schools, meaning that each school could make upwards of $3 million off of this deal. And obviously, after hearing this deal, the NCAA would completely panic and rip their hair out, thinking about what they can do now with only weeks until the season to combat this new television deal that would take away a large majority of their most viewed and highest revenue teams. There was some talk just before the season about the NCAA banning teams from the College Football Association from the other big bowl games. Since the Rose Bowl was under the NCAA umbrella because the Pac-10 and Big Ten had sided with them, the NCAA was talking with the Orange Bowl, Sugar Bowl, and Cotton Bowl about banning teams from the College Football Association from being in those highly revenued games. After that came out, it obviously angered all the teams, and some athletic directors even came out saying that the NCAA was threatening them. Two conferences that were especially pissed off were the Southwest Conference and the Big 8 Conference, since both of their champions had yearly gone to the Cotton Bowl and Orange Bowls, and if they were banned from it, that would be a big revenue loss to them. And it got so bad that college football officials were calling ABC, venting their frustrations about the NCAA. In turn, ABC officials would talk with the NCAA 
to get them into talking with the College Football Association because ABC was obviously trying to not lose a bunch of money by losing all of these teams to another network. But if you know anything about the NCAA and their first executive director, the hard-headed Walter Byers, he was not into talking with the College Football Association at all. His hard-headed nature and him not being the best communicator was the reason why the NCAA's TV package was pretty much the same for the last 20 years and had those same guardrails. Even though the money was going up, everything else was pretty much staying the same. And with ABC intervening in this now and nothing else coming from it, NBC would intervene and tell the College Football Association that they were backing them backing them so much that they would give them some of the legal fees to fight the TV deal and fight the NCAA in court. And that is where I'm going to leave this story off, as the College Football Association is going to be a huge part of the next few episodes of this series. And the next episode in this series, I'm going to be talking about this big lawsuit that would go through the courts so high up that it would get to the Supreme Court, where it would have a final decision that would change college football on television forever and also change college football forever. I'll get more into that over the next few episodes. As always, subscribe to the channel below, ring the bell so you can get updates on when those videos will be dropping, like and share this video and share this channel with other college football fans and help out my channel on my Patreon. The link is in the description below.